guys, how's it going? It's Flip the Mindset here, otherwise known as Kenny. So I'm going to tell you a wee bit about why I came up and how I came up with Flip the Mindset. I went through a very dark phase in my life. I lost my big brother. I lost my girlfriend of four and a half years, my kind of my childhood sweetheart. And a lot of things weren't going right for me, you know. I started being within myself a lot. So I had to go and identify my brother. That kind of gave me that off. Is this what life's about? Because, you you know, you're normally sheltered growing up, or most of us are sheltered growing up. And I bumped into this, this kind of big, massive monster on the road. And I'm looking at my brother, and he's lying there, and I'm like, it kind of almost kind of almost destroyed me from within. It changed me as a person. And that was my big kind of hello and welcome to the world. After that, I was really, really struggling. I was playing professional football at the time. I was beating myself up constantly every single day with guilt you know you're dealing with grief you're watching your mum who um we didn't have a, a father there so it was a mum and you're watching your mum change as a person of course because she's hurting so much and you really start doubting everything and being scared of everything so I get diagnosed with depression anxiety and PTSD so I'm playing pro- professional football and I came from a small town so I'd worked all my life to get to where I was and then I've lost my brother my mum's kind of changed. My nan and papa, who were really, really close to, cause being a single mum, you know, my mum was so close to our mum and dad and we were always there. So they were coming down with dementia. I really felt as if I had no one, you know, no one my age. None of my friends had lost someone so close and kind of knew knew what it was like. So it was just to kind of chin up, get head up, come on, it, it, you know, it'll be okay, time will heal and all that kind of stuff, but not really been there for me as such, which is not their fault, you know, it's not in our DNA to be compassionate or to have empathy, you know, it's something we need to kind of learn and, and, and kind of understand. So I feel myself getting lower and lower and things have changed. I'm now not playing football for myself and for um, the love of the sport. I'm starting to really start to hate myself. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I've got tremors. I'm, I'm not sleeping at night. I'm traveling all the way to Annan. And I've got too much time in my hands. I'm, I'm, I'm not working. I'm, I'm playing football. I'm traveling there. It takes two, three hours to travel because I come from Argyll. I'm constantly putting myself down and constantly starting to get kind of really not well. So I'm dealing with my anxiety. It's starting to affect me on the football pitch. I'm 22, turning 23. I've just kind of witnessed my brother lying there like a shell. Your world crumbles, you know. Your, your safety zone that you kind of get brought up with crumbles. You have a lot of fear, you know, that no fear that you had. You're, you're scared of everything now. You're scared of, what if I die? What if this happens? So you've got to understand, as a professional footballer, you're playing in front of fans. From I was playing in front of crowds from 500 people to 6,000. You have to be at your best. You have to be confident. And I was slowly losing all of that. I started more playing football for my friends, my mum, my town, and for my brother's memory. And I started playing less for... Um, my love of the game and um, for myself so that became I was almost like a robot you know I was going to football I was playing as someone else I was putting on someone else in the changing room because you can't show your weaknesses in football you know it's, it's just not it's not the way it works um, and I'm going there I'm putting on I'm leaving the front door and I'm thinking right you need to go into Kenny the football now you know you need to you know you need to get on the ferry you need to get on the train you need to wait an hour to get picked up and then you need to drive all the way to Annan I was coming back and then I'm having to stay overnight at someone's and then travel all the way back to Argyll. It started to wear, wear really, really thin on me. I'm beating myself up. I'm starting to hate myself. And then my knees start giving me jip on the football pitch. And I'm thinking, my life's falling apart here. What is going on? In football, when you're in the, the world of football, you don't get away with moaning and stuff like that. Or if you've got an injury, it's always like, no, it's fine. Little did I know I had chronic grade four tendonitis in both knees and and I was in for a a, a, a very hard four years. Tensions start growing with the, the manager of the football team and then obviously some of the players are thinking, does he really want it or not? And I was flying, you know, I had play I was up for player of the year, I was in the team of the year, I was player of the year in my team, but my knees were killing me. So and um, they were really, really bringing me down. So I'm then suffering with chronic knee pain, I'm suffering with not being able to grieve because I'm playing professional football and I have to keep my, my happy face on. 
I'm struggling with pretending I'm confident, pretending I'm happy, pretending there's nothing wrong. I'm struggling with going home. It was a place of sadness, you know. I went to football, which then turned out to be a place of sadness. And then I'm going out with my pals who don't understand what I'm going through, which then turned out to be a place of sadness. So I had nowhere. I had absolutely nowhere. I go for my first knee surgery after several fallouts from the manager. I recover. I come back. Now, leading up to that first knee surgery, I was getting constantly told it's all in your head. So then you're starting to think, is this my anxiety? Is this my brain playing tricks? Is my knee problems not really there? Is it just because I don't want to play football? Or am I actually not wanting to play for the team? It wasn't until that first surgery that the kind of, you know, the management team were like, um, okay, right, obviously you've had a problem there. So I have that surgery, I come back and I play, and then I'm getting it's all in your head again, just because you've had your surgery. Three knee operations later, I've got that pain for life now, you know, and I deal with a slight kind of wobble uh, as I walk, and that's just that's just a little bit of the story. So I started, obviously, trying to numb the pain. It took me about three and a half hours to get to training. So before I left the house, I'm taking my ibuprofen and my paracetamol. Because whenever I sat in this position, my knees would be in constant pain. I've got to sit in a train where I can stretch out a wee bit, yeah. And then I've got to be in a car for about an hour with this. Most times I was in the back of the car and my knees are throbbing. So I'm dealing with that and then I'm thinking, I deserve this pain. You know, this pain's because I wasn't there for my brother through his hard times. And I'm starting to really become a really dark force within my own head, um, seriously beating myself up, having all sorts of terrible thoughts. So I arrive at, when I was arriving at training, I'm taking my second lot of painkillers to train or to play the game on a Saturday or, or a midweek game. Doing that to try so much to get this pain going and then putting half a can of deep heat or deep freeze on it and getting strapped up from the physio takes a toll because you're constantly in a negative zone. You're in a negative headspace constantly. And I didn't need that. So that definitely didn't help. I remember each time sitting in the hospital thinking after surgery, post-surgery, and I'm thinking, I will come back. You know, I will come back. I've got to do it for my brother, for my mum, for the people of my town. You know, I've got to I've got to bring them something home because whenever I was in Sky Sports or um, in the newspapers and the of the Daily Record, everyone would just be lifted. I knew it was lifting my mum, most importantly. And I knew my brother would be proud, and I suppose in a way it kind of suppressed some of my guilt and stuff like that. I shouldn't have been guilty. It's not my fault that my brother passed away, but it's just something you feel when you're grieving. It's part of the grieving process. As time went on, surgery after surgery, I started to um, not really enjoy the game anymore and because I was getting so much pressure. And then the manager was saying things to the paper like I didn't want it and saying things to the fans. So they're asking me, you need to come back. I've got just injured all the time. And then not really knowing that I had some serious problems going on with my knees. So I started to have a sincere hate for football now. I hated that you couldn't open up. I hated that no one really listened. In football, it's, you've got a weird thing where most people are in it for themselves. What I always say is, apart from goalkeepers and defenders, they always are all about the team. Midfielders, strikers, I was a striker, mostly all in it for themselves. It's all self-game, you know. It should be self gain it's your own career, but there's just a weird, you know, there's a weird thing that goes on in football. So you're very alone, as many footballers will tell you. You are alone. You know, you've got 24 boys in that changing room or more, and each one of them are alone. I'll tell you that right now, you know. It's like 24 little boys and two kind of dads. Everyone will admit it. Some people will say, no, that's rubbish. But in most teams, it is. That's the way it is growing up. You're 24 little boys, even though you're men. 24 little boys, and no one will speak out. I think everyone's scared to voice an opinion, except for maybe one or two. Um, and everyone's scared to, to ask for help. You know, and that needs to change. And I think it is changing now. I'm lying in the hospital. I remember this plain as day. And I wake up in the Queen Elizabeth. And I'm just looking about the room. And, of course, my phone's going mental. I was at Queen's Park at the time. They have put on their website that um, I had a, um, a brutal injury. I'm looking around the room. And I just feel a wave of sadness, complete sadness. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm so depressed. I'm roaring and greeting. The nurse is coming in, trying to console me. I'm just lost. Because all that energy I was putting in, you know, the painkillers, constantly painkiller use, all the the hardships that I, that I had in my life and, you know, struggling growing up and not having a father there and stuff and, 
and um, everything was just coming into that was my identity. Football was my identity. That's what I'd done it for. That's what I was. That's what I was for. So starting to hate football, I felt like I lost myself. I lost everything about myself. I lost my identity. I lost everything I'd wanted to do since I was young. And it kind of all came to this, bang, you know, I'm empty. I'm done for. What can I do? What have I got? And I can remember sitting there, my cousin, Russell Leiser, walks in and he sees how, how down I am. And he starts crying as well. He's a hard, hard boy, you know. He starts, you know, I can see the tears in his eyes. And he's looking at me saying, it's been a long road and you've smashed it every, every time. You can come back from this one as well. And he left a book in the secret it was called. And it was fantastic. It was all about gratitude and practicing self-love, self-care, just achieving a higher energy. I've sat and read this all and I've done all the wee bits that you need to the gratitude every morning in the hospital. And that was a moment that changed my life completely. Every injury I, I had, I felt myself getting into the gym more because I had to do my recovery in the gym. And I'm starting to put all my anger and all my hate for myself into the weights. And it's becoming addictive because I've got an addictive personality. I started eating up to four or 5,000 calories a day and changing my foods to, you know, chicken and rice, tuna and rice. Um, footballers will tell you, I'd like to tell you their diet's good, but mostly they'll finish training and go to handles. You know, or be going to get eggs and all that. They're all, they're all greedy, greedy bastards. It's a bit like um, Lee Griffiths when they were on the, the, the non-sugar and Lee Griffiths is caught having the tea cake in the dugout, you know what I mean? Because footballers don't really, like, most footballers don't really care about diet. You know, they've, they've got their ability, they've got their skill and they let that be their ego. It's maybe why a lot of people don't get as good as they can be. As I say, after every operation, I'm, I'm getting into the gym more, you know, and I'm starting to grow in muscle, you know, I'm starting to get bigger, I'm starting to get bigger, I'm starting to get bigger. I'm starting to find a purpose. And I think most people that get addicted to fitness, they do it to fill a void. They don't do it because they like it and stuff like that. You, you'll go to a gym and I can guarantee you that 80 to 90% of that gym are in poor mental health. They've got a void to fill. They're struggling in some way. And they go to the gym. That lifts them. They start finding friends in the gym. You'll see it all the time. You'll see it happening all around you. They'll find friends in the gym that are addicted as well. They'll start leaving their own friends for their friends. You know, they'll start dressing differently, they'll start, you know, the, the kind of caps, the socks, the shorts, the, the tank tops, the leggings and all that stuff, gym shark daft, and they start changing. So I was getting sucked into that, of course, and I was loving it. I felt part of something again that I didn't need to do for other people. I was bodybuilding just for me, and that felt good. That felt great, you know. Um, it started to bring me alive more, and it's probably the only thing that, that, that I held on to going through many surgeries, to be honest. I started to get a wee bit bigger. And I'm muscly and I started using my advantage and I kind of run riot that year. And then everyone's obviously saying, you're damaging your knees, stuff like that. But I didn't care because um, I've got a purpose now. I've got another purpose, a wee hidden purpose that's, that's keeping me going. And then, as I say, I'm in the hospital after my last operation. I say to myself, if I can't play football again, because the Scotland doctor is the one that done my operation, I can't play football again. No, well, I'll tell you when I was when I, when I get taken to the hospital. Queen's Park, by the way, were phenomenal. They were phenomenal with me. I remember Queen's Park took me on when I was recovering from a long... When Anne let me go and Queen's Park took me on, I felt trashed, you know. Not through Anne and just through myself, you know. Anne and fans and, and some of the staff were just incredible to me. They're the best people, some of the nicest people I've ever met. But when I was going in Queen's Park, Gus McPherson came and he wanted me to play for him. And this is just at a moment where I'd, I had big teams in for us. I had Don Perman in. You know, I had Grant Morton in, four-year deals on the table too. I had numerous teams and a couple of English teams in. Gus McPherson has came and um, and took me kind of under his wing. And he's just been amazing to me. And I'm thinking, this is unreal, man. Brilliant. And he's he understands my injury and he understands what I'm going through. I can see it in his eyes when he looks at me. So I feel a sense of, oh, you know, this is fantastic. Because at Annan, in training and stuff, my anxiety was so bad. You see it in a lot of players like Fernando Torres, who came back from injury, um, Arshavin for Arsenal, Eduardo, um, Morelos, and now, even though he wasn't injured, your anxiety is so bad or you're thinking about so many other things that you, you start to become a second or two behind the game. You're fit, but your head's not, you know. You can see the ball coming to you, but you're that anxious thinking about different things. The ball bounces off you and then you react. And I was doing this constantly and I felt... I was scoring the goals on a Saturday because I had a purpose, you know, I had a purpose. I was doing this for my family. Score the goals. I would play amazing. And whenever else, when the Saturday came at training, I was terrible. So I went to 
Queen's Park and we're in Lesser Hampton and I came out my first training session. I'm flying, you know, I'm thinking, this is brilliant, I feel no pressure. Don't get me wrong, I've been bodybuilding now for about three years, you know, I'm starting to get quite big. I'm a bit like Teori now. I'm a bit like I can fame, I'll say not Teori, I was more I was bigger. I'm playing in Lesser Hampton, I'm training. I'm starting to, you know, I'm, I'm pegging people, I'm playing one two, so there was phenomenal players there. And it all bounced off me and they all love me, you know, and I feel like right, okay, I've got this again. I have got this, you know, I've got it. I'm back. I'm going to go and I'm going to play. I'm going to I'm going to start scoring goals again. I'm going to do it for myself again as well as other people. And I'm starting to find a wee bit of, of purpose again with the football. So I'm that two ways. I'm thinking, right, I've got the fitness there and I've got the, the football. And they're keeping me going now. So I've got a new team and Gus was brilliant with me. And I worked my way up to get a start, you know, and Gus is like, listen, be, he writes to the, the, he says in his interview, be, be, um, be patient with Kenny, you know, he's came back through a lot and it might take him a bit to get going. So I come on as a sub and I think there's maybe 12 minutes left. And I come on and I'm running about thinking this is unbelievable, you know, I'm in Hamden again, which I scored quite a lot of goals in Hamden um, when I was with Annan, so it was nice to be back there and I'm on top of the world. I'm really feeling good. So I played the 12 minutes Pats in the back, all the teammates are just brilliant. They can't wait till I get started because I'm pinging in training. You know, I'm playing well. Tuesday night comes at training. And I'll never forget this. I'm training and I'm having one of the best nights of my life in training. We're playing a small kind of seven-a-side game. Um, and we're pinging it about. We're pinging it off the edge to people where people stand around the edge. Pinging it off the edge. I'm, I'm bouncing the ball with a boy, Jamie McKernan and, and Woodsy and that, that are there. Just great boys. And um, I'm scoring goal after goal after goal. Until the ball comes to me. And I go, I'm feeling so good. I'm going to hit this with my left foot right in the top bin. So I go to hit it with my left foot. And crack. Just the worst noise you've ever heard in your life. It was brutal. And I fell to the ground. don't know where the ball's went. It's probably hit the flat, one of the flat windows and smashed it. You know what I mean? And I fell to the ground. And I'm screaming. I've never felt pain. I've done my legs before, obviously, before or previously. I've never felt pain like this one in my life. It was like a baseball bat, right? And I'm lying in the ground. I'm going, who's hit me? Who the hell tackled me there? What? What? Fucking hell. And no one had tackled me. My leg had just had so much pressure in the grade 4 10 90s. There was so much done to it. And, and I'd played through so much pain. I'd wore my leg out that much that it was just like a, like a, like it was like a ricochet effect. It was like a slingshot. And it had, boom, popped. And it snapped it. Um, ruptured my patella tendon, damaged my cordyceps tendon. It was brutal. Players were coming over and bulking and running away to be sick. Gus McPherson was coming over and bulking and nobody could just believe what had happened. So I've, they've took me to the hospital. They've been amazing with me. You know, they must be thinking, listen, you've done... I remember Brian Walton, who was a fantastic guy, he came up to me. He says, listen, I know how hard you've worked. Um, to get back and I know what you've went through we know it you know and we want to be there and we just hope it's nothing bad all right and they took me to hospital they all carried me up took me to hospital they waited on me it was brilliant and I went to the hospital and I'm waiting there and it was a Scotland doctor or a, a, someone who does Scotland operations or something and he's um he's a Queen's Park fan and he seen me come on yeah you never write this he seen me come on at the weekend as a sub and he looked at me and I'm in my Queen's Park and he goes oh my god Kenny and he looks and he examines me and he just walks away and comes back and says, Kenny, I'm so sorry. He says, I do not think you'll ever play again. And I'm um, floods back memories now, man. I'm like, well, you know, I'm like, you know, it's all this, all that work, all that torture, all that, having to straighten my leg all the time, all them sleepless nights, all this depression, anxiety, all these flashbacks of... of of, of you know of my brother's face the last few years all this all this madness you know all this madness has came to this when I was just about to get back and I was flying and everything was looking up in my life and it's taken away and I say boom I've got to tell you football moves on football doesn't wait for no one you know you could be flying and then you get injured and you just bring in two strikers to replace you and you, you just get dumped and that's the sad reality of football. It just moves on. You know, you might not get your chance again. It doesn't wait for you. It's just none of that in football. It's the kind of business it is. And you have to understand that. So I start going, right, if I'm not going to play football again, I'm going to be a sort of Olympia. I'm going to bodybuild. I'm going to get as big as I can. I'm going to show that I can get massive and I can get 
um, into a shape that no one would believe. Everyone says you'll never be able to do it with your legs again, you'll never be able to do this. I says, listen, I've got no fear anymore. You know, I've been broken, totally broken. I've seen I'm not really going to be scared of nothing. You know, I'm not scared of anything anymore. Um, and pain, it's pain's my best friend. Literally, I've dealt with it for years and I've had to learn to fall in love with the pain because it's always with me now. So I start bodybuilding. And I'm taking it serious now, you know, I'm whacking my calories up to 6,000 calories. Um, I'm not really looking at the evidence, you know, I'm training to be a personal trainer. Um, in college, before I'd done sports science, I'm getting all this info, but even though I'm reading about my diet, I'm just saying, no, I'm eating as much as I can. I'm listening to the big boys and think, eat hard, train hard, let's go. And I'm getting bigger. And I'm getting really big. And this is nine months, 13, 14 months after I had like a 14 to 16 month recovery. That was brutal enough, you know, and getting it back. And I could feel as if, it was never going to get better. So I thought, why do you need most of it? I'm bodybuilding and I'm full force for this. All my pain and all my anger is going into lifting heavy, heavy weights. You know, I'm benching 240 kilo. I'm at a ridiculous weight. You know, I'm doing mad things. I'm squatting 200 kilo on a knee that I've, on two knees that I never thought would do anything again. But on orthodox and a wee bit, you know, a wee bit wobbly, but that's the way it is. And I never knew why, you know, people used to say, oh, you're chocolate, you just get injured all the time. And that just means like, like um, you'll have an injury as well. Don't go back to football because you'll this and that. Don't bodybuild because you'll get injured. So I'm I'm putting all my, my pain and I'm, I'm fighting my demons through the weights. You know I've got to eight thousand calories and then ten thousand calories. And I start I start going a bit mental with it, you know. And, and people don't understand that bodybuilding can be very, 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 very lonely as well. You get fitness addiction. You feel like you fit in, but you don't. You're you're constantly fighting with muscle dysmorphia, you know, you're, you're constantly um, looking in the mirror thinking, I'm, so I was sitting at 23 stone, 22 stone 7, and I'm looking at my biceps and I'm just not big enough. And I'm starting to go mad in my own head, you know. And it's a serious thing because so many people struggle with it. So I'm starting to get a wee bit lost in that. You know, I'm starting to get a wee bit lost in that as well. Um, but that's a, that's a story for another podcast. I've came to boiling point. I'm best man at my brother's wedding when he was alive. It was the best day of my life, you know, because he was so proud of me. I was so proud of him. And um, and it really was the best day of my life, you know. I can't explain what it's like to... to my brother was not my dad as well, you know, he was there. You know, my papa and my brother were... were my dad's... They looked after me. They, um, my brother taught me football, you know. He, he taught me to not care about not having a dad at the sideline. He said, your mum's there. He said, mum's there. Mum was shouting for me every week. She's the best person in the world. She's... She's just a gem. Can't talk please her enough. So, my brother's wedding. I'm flashbacking it, you know. I'm getting flashbacks here and then I'm getting flashbacks of, um, from the PTSD of his face, his, his um, shell. And I can't tell you that, I'll tell you. I didn't like how they done this. I walked in to the morgue. I identify her from my mum and that. My mum's pleaded with me not to go. And I'm saying, no, I'm the man. I'm the man of the house now. I'm going. And I go and identify him. And I just don't know if it's sat, you know, that's never sat right with me. They wheeled him out, right, and they uncovered his face. <clears throat> his feet were hanging out the bottom. The sheet wasn't right over him. You could see the side of his body. So you're seeing a sunken in bit. And then you're seeing what looked like a pool of blood. Do you know, like, the blood sinks to the bottom of the body, right? So it's chalk white at the half top half of his body, and it's just dark red at the bottom half. It's the horrible, it's the weirdest thing you've ever seen. So he's staring as if his eyes had rolled back to the top right of the room. So me being me, of course, I'm, I'm taken away, I'm, I'm, there's all these new things coming on my head, I'm, 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 I'm unbelievably scared, I'm terrified, I'm, I'm wanting to, I'm just wanting to look him in the eyes. I don't know what I was wanting to, I don't know what I was thinking, to be honest. I was just walking around the room and I've looked at him and, and I've caught him, you know, where his eyes are up to the right, and I've caught I'm square in the eyes, and I'm looking straight at him, and he's just got the most scared face, the most terrified face, and uh, he's he's unshaven. <clears throat> he just looks so scared, and his eyes are rolled up, and, and, and that, that was my PTSD, that kind of triggered it. I've seen that flashback for about a year, I've seen that flashback, and it was brutal, and it haunted me. You know, everything about seeing him like that, seeing it, he was just a shell now. He was nothing. He was just, you know, stop me believing in God. Stop me believing in anything. I 
found myself at the worst point in my life. So my mum's went out, and I'm terrible, and I'm, I've had suicide thoughts for months. I'm not wanting to die. People need to understand that. A lot of the times people are committing suicide or people are thinking about suicide, we don't want to die. Do you know what I mean? We just want to get away from what we're dealing with. The demons are destroying us. We're, we're, we're feeling, you know, for me, I was so guilty. I felt so guilty of not being there for my brother because I'd moved up to my girlfriends at the time who are lost. So I've um, I've moved up there. Something had happened that week, I'll tell you. Um, I'm always honest, how you guys know. I had fell out with my sister doing silly stuff. I was sitting down at the bookies all day I started gambling. And uh, it's a horrible habit many that footballers get all the time. Now, I wasn't gambling ridiculous amounts because I didn't have ridiculous amounts. I wasn't playing football. My, my wage got halved. I was gambling. So what happened is there was a day that Tracy, my sister, God bless her, she'd left £50 in the house and I'd fell out to the world or something, something to happen. And my brother had come in and he wasn't going through a good time and he was, he was acting a little out of sorts um, and we all fell out, basically. Uh, apart from my mum, she was always in that held things together. I then took my sister's money that she needed for something and I went down to the bookies to spend it. And that was on the Thursday night. I've then got my girlfriend to pay for me to go to Glasgow to stay with her to get away from it all. Now you've got to realise that's never sat right with me for, for years. It haunts me today. And I went to Glasgow on the Thursday. My brother must have been missing on the Thursday night. So I went up to Glasgow on the, on the Wednesday. And then on a Sunday night at 7, at 7 o'clock, I'll never forget this, my mum phones me. She says, um, Dave is missing. We're really, really worried. We can't find him. Because we knew he was having an awful time. He was getting in and out of trouble. He was he was in a real bad way. He was hanging about with the wrong people, just pure idiots. He was a good man, you know. He had a business. Um, he, he was um, apprentice of the year and all that. Had people working for him, a massive painting and decorator business. He had two cars, a van, a wife. And I son at the time. So my mum's off the phone. And I'm like, okay, he'll just be in a bender. You know, he'll just be out. You know, it's like you go out for a couple of days and then you'll come home. Like most people do so many people these days, you know. It's a gaff. I'm sitting with my girlfriend, Neil mate at the time. God bless her. We are lying watching a film. And it came to quarter to 12. I'll never forget it. And my mum's phoned and she said my name. And as soon as she said my name, I knew that something was wrong. You can see, you know, you can tell, you just get that rush over you. And she says, David's been found and he's, um, he's dead, basically. He's not here anymore. A wee bit later, I'd found out that my mum and her friend had went up to try and find him on maybe the Saturday or something. There's a wee window at his flat. I don't know how I think of this. There's a wee bit at the bottom that you can see through, which I knew. And he went up to try and chap his bedroom window to get him out. But my mum can't reach the window. She's just tapping it with her hand up there. No answer. And he's been lying in there dead. Or we don't know because he slipped into a coma and then died. So but I would have seen that. And I know I can't beat myself up about that. But if I was in Dunoon at the time, if I was home at the time, I would have seen that. I would have looked through the window and I'd seen if he was in trouble or if he was dead. Or if we could have saved him, you know. That I've, I've bent myself up for for years. I still do now. And I know it's not my fault because things happen in life and, and, and I've learned to overcome that. But that killed me, you know, killed me. I'm sitting at, um, you know, we all make mistakes in life and that's just one that I'll never, I'll never forgive myself for. Um, I'm sitting in my house and I'm, my mum's in a way out, as I say. I'm drinking vodka, do you remember it? And I'm watching, it's a, it's a bit. Two o'clock in the day, I think. Uh, my mum's out. She was supposed to be staying at my nana's that night. Cause she goes up and helps him and, and cared for him. I've put his wedding video on and I'm rolling the gate. And I finish it. I'm rolling the gate again. And I've had suicidal thoughts of these you know. So I've been in the kitchen and I've got pills out. It's about 60 paracetamol. And I've put it in three cups, three different cups. I don't know why. Each of 20. It's just kind of a scare. You don't know where you are. You know, you're scared. You know, it'll do one cup and if that doesn't do it, bang. I say just take them all at the same time, whatever. I don't know. And I'm watching his wedding video the same time. And there's a bit where I'm doing my best man speech. 
and then he comes up and does a wee speech. I'm obviously I'm about to I'm about to do it. I'm about to kill myself. I'm about to attempt to kill myself. And the the door opens, and I've got the whole kitchen, the house in darkness. You know, I've wrote my notes. Everyone, I've I've sent a few of my friends texts, just saying that I love them and my girlfriend at the time texts. Just you know, I gave her a hard time when I was struggling. I, I, I went to do it, and the doors opened. And then comes my mum and her best friend for a reason that I don't know what happened that day. I just, they saved my life, she saved my life. And I was a bit of for a bit, and I understand that sounds so, so selfish, I know, but when you when you were going through what I was going through in my head and the amount of pain and the amount that I endured, even watching my brother, his downfall and stuff was so hard. I was losing the guy that, you know, that I looked up to, and then he passed away, and then all that was going on. And I felt I had not I convinced myself, I think that's what you do, you get addicted to the sadness and you get depressed, depressed more and more and more. And I'd convinced myself that I was mental, you know. My mum's come in. She'd been like, what the hell, you know, my auntie Catherine's there as well and giving me hugs and I've just burst out crying. You know, I cried for about two days, I think three days, you know. Everything had come out, you know, because you're trying to stay strong for everyone, you know, you're that I'm that different person playing football every day. I'm trying to hold up things for, for other people, you know, I'm playing not playing for myself anymore, you know, I'm like a like a just like a walking a walking sadness, you know. All sorts of things have gone through my head, you know, I'm gambling at the time, I'm I'm not drinking anything like that, and I was never like that. I'm just I'm just losing myself, you know, and I'm that's all coming out now, you know, within two, three days it's all coming out to my mum, my auntie, my friend, she called my best pal, one of my best pals in the world, he's like my brother Johnny Lahim, who also lost his mum. And uh, we went through that, we went through so much, you know. His mum, my auntie Jeannie, was a phenomenal lady we'd grown up together. Me and Johnny played football together. He's one of the best footballers I've ever seen, yet he didn't make it professional. And we, we lost his mum to throat cancer. Three months, I think, she, she lasted when she was told. So we went through a lot, you know, we went through a lot. A baby had died in my sister's house. My sister's best friend's baby got caught deaf in my sister's house. We don't know what caught deaf is, and it was brutal. It was a brutal time. Although I just tried to do that, I felt just like everything had been lifted. So much had been lifted. My mum had sat down and she said words to me. She'd been through a really tough life. She'd been battered off um, her ex-husband and she'd woke up under anaesthetic with paralysis. She'd had a really, really tough life, you know, and she'd had a wee bit of anxiety. She says, Ken, it doesn't matter how bad things get. She says, what's brought me through is hope. That kind of sat with me. Hope that things will get better, you know, like it's not your fault. So all that done, I started the road to recover. When I was struggling, there wasn't a lot of things that went right for me at the time. It was I'm dealing with some moms made me get help before I tried to commit. She made me get help. She said, No, you need to go down. You know you're so proud and you're just yeah you've been amazing. You know, I was I was head boy at school two years in a row. I was head boy then deputy head boy. I was national athletics, I played national badminton, you know, I was very you know, I had ADHD when I was younger. I was very um, competitive and I was proud. And that all be stripped away. Everything was stripped away in my football. So she drove me to go down. You know, she loved me. Don't off me. She's the best mum in the world. She's just the best all ever. She drove me down. She, she forced me to go to the doctors. So we're sitting in the doctors. Nobody was really listening to me. Finally, they put me up. They, they, took, they put me to a psychologist because I was going pretty rough. I was starting to people at my bra was hanging about me. I was, I was, I was, I was planning really bad things. To do, to do to them, which I'm not proud of. I was, you know, I was going to torture them, take them away, whatever, murder them, I don't care. Planning this in my head, which is no laughing matter, you know, I was just in a horrible place. And I was either going to do that to them or I was taking my own life, you know. I would never hurt someone like that, you know, I would never do that. I think it was just to give me a purpose. It's take me away from taking my own life, you know. And that's, I know that's hard to imagine, but I would never, if people know me, I would never hurt someone like that. I'm not that kind of person. But I'm thinking it, and this is a thing that a lot of people are anxiety get. They won't never admit it, but you know I've had loads of people come to me with that thing where they want to do something to someone or hurt someone or something. Don't admit that person's doing it wrong. It's just this horrible anxiety and depression thoughts in your head. And you start freaking yourself out, thinking, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And you're not actually going to do it, you're just thinking it. I'm at doctors, and they send me a psychiatrist. And he puts me on something called citalopram, 40 milligram, highest level they can, they can give. He wasn't a nice fellow, he was like, kind of, you know, he was... I felt like he wasn't in the room with me. You know, I felt like he was making money in his job, but 
he didn't want to be in that room with me. He didn't want to be there. He wanted to be home or out or whatever. And I felt as I was telling my story to no one. And he goes, listen, I'm going to put you on Stylopram, 40 milligram. I'm going to put you on Cotiopine. Uh, and I was like, what's Cotiopine? And he goes, it's an antipsychotic. And I'm thinking, oh. well, he thinks I'm nuts. Do you know what he, he thinks I'm mental? I must be mental. I must be losing the plot. And that was damaging, you know, to think I've went from that to a person who really, I don't deserve to be here anymore. I'm not, I'm, I'm a danger to someone. I'm a danger to society. I'm embarrassing. I just became this gambling guy who sits and feels sorry for himself because his knees are, are, are fucked. No girlfriend anymore and he's just a waster. And I convinced myself of that. I really convinced myself of that. Which is not the case. You know, it's not the case at all. It was just a lovely big boy with a heart that had been through so much pain and hardship and endurance and tragedy that he was beating himself up. I'm so hard on myself with everything I do. People will know that. Understanding that, maybe if you're not, if you're watching this and you've not went through poor mental health, it's a place where you, you start to believe things that's not true. And you start to actually become what you believe. And you start to go in a spiral, you start going down and down, you start to you start to become your thoughts as such until your thoughts of until who you actually are is gone. And if who you actually are is gone, you don't want to live anymore. Okay, so my first guest on the podcast is going to be Tia. Tia's got a, an exceptional um, personality. When she's not sleeping, licking me or snoring, she's um, snoring. <laughs> so at one point I went to a friend with a problem This one, I'll never forget this I've asked him for help or I've asked him for you know, whatever it was something and he goes that sounds like a Kenny problem and I was like whoa I'm screaming in my head to say I want to tell you all the stuff I want to tell you this I want to tell you that and uh, how I'm feeling I want to tell you this but then I'm just like oh, I must know but he didn't know, of course, but that made me go with him myself too much. So I think like what people are saying now is you've got to be kind. You never, ever know what people are going through in your life. Someone could be contemplating suicide that night and you, you turn around and say something like, well, that's a Kenny problem. So that is what led me to my suicide attempt, as of such, which I shouldn't be here now, but was it for my mum or my brother? I really think it was my brother. I really do. I love to believe it was my brother. Because that would be... That's, that's just a, that's a great fun. My brother loved me. He was my number one fan. He really was. Especially at this kind of time. The coronavirus, the pandemic. So many people are losing people to the coronavirus. You don't know exactly what I'm describing. And the pain, the heart, the anguish, the numbness. And it's, it's hard. But I can tell you that time... I remember that was said to me. Time is a healer, but only if you make it so. I didn't help myself for a long, long time. When I started helping myself, when I made flip my mindset, when I started helping myself, remember I didn't have a purpose. And when you don't have a purpose, you've got two decisions. Carry on in the darkness. Or make your own fucking purpose. Make one. Same if you don't have a job now, go self-employed, go do something for yourself, do it, you know. You know, if it's like if you don't have um a brush, you know, make one, good kitchen towel, that's it, you know. No, but what I'm trying to say is I had to make my own purpose. I didn't want to go to the darkness anymore. I wanted to be out. I wanted to, to, to rise out of that. So I made one and I made for the mindset, I said to myself, what can I do? I was thinking of my nana and my mum are two of the nicest people you ever meet, my papa. And they taught me, they, they grew me up to be nice, to be so humble and to be to give everything before you do stuff for yourself. Because they were content with themselves, you know, they were they, they gave everything, they, they put everyone first. My nana would make sure this person okay with me. Why do you do it? She goes, I'm okay. Because I'm content, I'm I'm okay, I'm good with myself. Helping people helps me, you know, and, and she was content. So she didn't really need to fix her own problems because she was okay. And I thought, right, if I can get to a state of contentness and I can do that with helping other people, I can flip the mindset, I can become a better person. So I wrote this plan. So I'm sitting there, as you see in one of my videos I've posted, and I'm lying in my bed, not quite like the video of laying in the bed with the, with the things that was just kind of 
um, showing how it was done, but I've sat in my bed and um, my bed, my bed's done today. You know, I went through four years of hardly doing my bed, of wrappers all over my room. I know that sounds like a normal teenager's or a normal 22-year-old's room, but it's not. I wouldn't be washing as much. That's when I knew I was starting to get really bad. I wouldn't wash, I wouldn't take showers. I know that sounds disgusting, but that's the way it was. I wouldn't cut my nails unless my mum was forcing me to. I wouldn't do anything basically unless my mum was forcing me to. I didn't feel like a person anymore. I didn't feel like I belonged anymore. I wasn't really taking care of myself. My hair was going longer. You know, I'm not going for haircuts as much. I don't really want to leave the house. I'm playing my PlayStation every day for hours. I'm staying up playing my PlayStation because if I knew, if I played till I was tired, I could fall asleep like that. But if I didn't, if I went to sleep in my bed and I wasn't tired, my demons would eat me alive. And then I would get panic attacks and anxiety and stuff like that. So if I kept playing my PlayStation at five in the morning, go to sleep, wake up the next day at two in the afternoon, that was my cycle for a long time. Now remember, I'd wake up at two in the afternoon and leave to go to Annan to play football at four. But people didn't know that because I didn't tell them. And I should have. That would have saved me and stopped me suffering for so much longer than it was. And I was very good at putting on a good face. So anyway, I'm sitting in my bed. It's clean now. And it's not sheets that I've not washed in ages or I won't wash till my mum comes in and does it for me like she used to do everything for me. She's a gem. I'm sitting with a four piece of paper and I says, I want to change, I want to do something. If I can't do this and I can't do that, I need to do something. I write, flip the mindset. I don't know why I write it. And I put on that because of what my mum said to me. Platform of hope. And I says, right, how can I flip my mindset? I says, right, I'm going to make something, I'm going to write something, a book. It's going to be my journey coming back from the darkest of places, which is what, what Fit the Mindset is. It's a platform of hope for people who are struggling with the pressures of modern society, and it can bring you back from the darkest of places. I says, right, what am I going to do? So I says, right, I'll start with two positive things I can do a day. And this sounds weird, I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. I would wait about Morrison's for a bit longer than I should have when I was going to get something. And I would hold the door open for an old man or an old woman. I would speak to them with a lot of energy. All right, sir, how are you doing? You know, and he would go, oh, you're a gentleman, thank you very much. And a wee old woman was there and I'd be like, listen, let me take them back to the car. I would do it for her and she would go, son, we need more people like you, you know, it's, it's amazing. I would maybe talk to them for a bit and I would go away going, I feel phenomenal. I feel great. Or I would do something like go up to my nan's with flowers, or I would go up and meet them, my nan and papa, a cup of tea, you know. Um, I would just do, or I would do something for my mum. A lot of the, the boys would um, be getting out all the time. They always called me the one that was late all the time. You're late, you're late, you're late. You're late. I would be having my Friday night fish and flopper with my mum because that was my thing. Never not have it. They would moan at me all the time because they would just walk out, you know. It's like when me living with my mum, my brother and sister moved out early. It was me and my mum. We were really, really close. I wasn't a kid. Until I was depressed and in that bad place, I was never a kid to sit in my room all day. I would never sit in my room all day and, and, and just not go downstairs. No, that's very common. But I would never do that. I was always in the living room with my mum, watching what she watched, and she would watch what I watched, and we were just so close. We become best friends. Um, people who have grown up single parents might understand that. I was never a boy to, to, to just sit in my room. I was always with my mum. So what I was getting was that it wasn't about self-care because I was reading a lot about that. Be selfish, do this, do that for yourself, do that. But that doesn't mean that you need to be selfish. That can mean that you need to be selfless. You know, that mean, that doesn't mean that you need to go and buy a car. You need to go and buy this to make yourself feel better. You need to do this and block this and do that and do that um, for yourself. And it's all you, you, you. But what you can do is you can start doing things for other people that is, is going to benefit you. It's kind of the same thing. Many of us don't see that way. We don't see as giving out energy is going to bring us that energy in return. We think that doing everything and being self and being really selfish towards ourself is going to get us in that better place. But it's, a lot of it's not the case because a lot of us do competitive mindsets. We're never happy enough with everything we give ourselves. You know, we buy ourselves something that's never good enough after a couple of months. You know, we get a Louis Vuitton bag and we've used it in a night out. It becomes a Louis Vuitton bag. It's, it's, it's money wasted. It's, you know, sitting there. Some people might not believe it and that's fine. But I felt that giving, helping people, being there for people, was what was giving me that selfish self-care. So it was selfish, selfless, self-care. I started thinking, hang of your circle. You know, I was thinking this years ago. You know, I know it's probably been done in books now, but your circle. I was thinking, right, I've got a circle. I need good energy in my circle. So my circle of friends need to maybe, I need better energy. So I started saying, right, okay, if my energy is 96%, 
then I am going to um, be in a good place. Now, if I'm letting too much negativity, sorry, into my circle, it's going to go, sorry, you know, tip towards the negative side. That could be um, thoughts, that could be habits, that could be um, your friends who are maybe pulling you down, or they are maybe struggling and giving you their bad energy. You, you just maybe need to change your, the way you approach them, friends, that benefits you a bit more, you know, and you're not taking um, on so much and letting it destroy you, you know. So by this energy thing, I was like, okay, I've got something here. I've, I've got something that's making me feel a lot, lot better, making me feel 10 times better than myself. It's making me value things more. It's making me value what I've got more. It's making me, you know, appreciate. So I, I brought up a five-step, and it was appreciate. Appreciate that I'm still alive, right? Appreciate that my mum walked in and saved my life. Appreciate that I have got the chance and I have got the tools to do better for myself, for others, and with my life, you know, and to feel better. I've got the tools to do that. Before, when I was depressed, I didn't... I had the tools, but I didn't know I had the tools, you know? The tools are there, you know, your, your changes, your habits, your positive thinking, your positive thoughts, it's all there, but we just get lost in how to use them to the advantage. It's a bit like searching for a torch in the woods when, when you've got this, the... Um, the tools in the woods to make your own fire yourself to bring light into your life, you know. Acceptance. Okay, I've got to accept that my brother passed away, you know, my football career ended. I've got to accept that I've done all the bad things I've done. I've nicked that 50 quid, been nasty to someone or whatever. I accept it, you know, I deal with it. I talk about it. I move on with it. I write it down. That was a big thing for me, writing it down. I accept that now. It's no longer a huge burden on me. It's no longer weighing me down. Movement. We move. We move with good energy, you know. I've got to move forward now. I've got to do positive things. I've got to make positive choices that are going to make my life better. Not just give me a better quality of life, but give me a better headspace. Give me a more positive mindset. I'm not a materialistic guy. I don't see the value in stuff like whatever I've got, as um, my partner will tell you. I'll bash it off things. I'll just don't see that. It's, it's, if I get it as a present, then fine. But I really will buy something fancy for myself. Because the value is not there. But even if you do, you do that, that's fine. But if you build your life on materialistic things, that is never going to help. Buy yourself an iPhone. The iPhone 12 comes out. You're not happy to get the iPhone 12. All the materialistic things, that doesn't fill the headspace. You know, it just gives you a temporary high. It doesn't destroy the negative thoughts of it and that eating you up. It just gives you temporary high until you get used to it, it's gone and then your mindset's down in the dumps again. So anyway, and then it was um, make things happen. So this is when I started putting everything into into motion. All right, I'm in a bit of headspace now. Apply for jobs. If I get not accepted, okay, I can apply for another job. You know, I appreciate I'm not accepted for that job. I accept that they've not given me a platform to go and show them how, how good I am in that job role, but I can apply for another one. It's not the end of the world, do you know what I mean? Keep going and going like that. So when I had that change in my mindset, I started seeing the world, woof, was blown away. I started seeing the world from a trillion different angles. Bad things would happen to me, I'd then be like, that's all right, yeah, we'll get there, we'll work on it, we'll come back there. You know, I would maybe be struggling with money, right, all right, I need to get down and dirty to get to, to, get to a, a better place because money's not everything, but if you have to pay your bills, you have to pay your bills, you know, you have to take care of yourself. So, and my last one was change the world. Now, that's not a pressure I put on myself. That was just a fun one. That was the fun. Change the world. What can I do to change the world? Flip the mindset. I can help other people. It's just my fun one, you know. If you are doing this list and you write it, and your last one's your own one. It's your fun one. What is it? Is it become a ballet dancer? You could be a big burly male like me. Who would become a ballet dancer? So that's your fun one. Work to it while you're taking all, all your other headspace. Become a ballet dancer. Do something different. So mine was to change the world. And it was to give people a platform of hope for the people who were struggling with the pressures of modern day society. And to get people from back from the darkest of places. You know, I can do it. You, I'm telling you right now, if I can do it, and I was in a terrible way. I was in a seriously bad place. If I can do it, so can you. So can you. The only person that's stopping you is you. And I'm not saying that in that way, you see me as motivational speeches. The little person stopping you is you, you get your head out your ass, all that stuff. No, I'm just saying that you have the tools. You need to believe in yourself. You need to make it happen. You need to make the positive choices. You just need to change certain things. Like my list went to 20 things. So it went two things I could do a day. Then in four or five days' time, three positive things I can do a day that are going to benefit and enhance my life. Five positive things, six positive things, 12 positive things, then into 20 positive things. To then I was so getting used 
to being positive all the time and doing positive stuff. And everyone was like, Kenny, Kenny, your energy is like what it was like at school. Your energy is sky high. And everyone that knows me knows that. You come into a room and you're like, wow, blah, blah, blah. But it's not fake anymore. You know, it's 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 the flip. It's, it's the mindset here. My energy is now at that level where I've now drilled into myself a positive attitude. I am now a positive person. And that doesn't mean I don't struggle. I'm not sitting in front of you guys now saying I don't struggle and have my bad days. My partner will tell you I have some seriously bad days. I still suffer with some panic attacks. I still suffer with waves of anxiety that come and go and some guilt sometimes, but I look at it differently now. It's not it's not the world's out to get me now, you know? It's okay. Think about there's a path ahead of you, right? Before and you're looking into the future, right? So make it you're in the future and you've got this big long path and every landmark in your life's on it, right? Now bring yourself to the present. There's a path ahead of you. And there's all these kind of oval stones, right? And they're all set to negative. Do you get that? Do you understand it? They're all set to negative. If you're looking at this path and it's going negativity, negativity, lost job, lost girlfriend, it's going to attempt suicide that night, bad thoughts, you know, pressures, this pressure, COVID, all the stuff that's had, all the madness. And as you go through life, you have to flip that stone over. To the positive sides. So then you're going through a stone and anything that's getting thrown at you, boom, pop that stone, right, pop that stone. You're going to get stones that you can only maybe half flip over. Like over your COVID, you can't choose it, but you've got to decide how you deal with that, you know? And that's your positive choice. COVID comes, all right, then I'm going to do other stuff. I'm going to maybe um, PT from home. I'm going to maybe read books more. I'm going to do other stuff to, to get by. And through life, I was imagining this path and something was coming to me and I think that's a kick in the buzz. I squat one time and I kind of brought my knee out and again and it set me back and my legs were just not getting any bigger at one point as well. And this negative stone's there and I'm struggling to flip it. And I think, right, okay, I rest. Come back to you, mate. You know, do the recovery, walk back to that stone, flip it and then boom, I'm on my journey again. So I wanted to make this podcast for what Flip the Mindset is all about. It's a platform of hope for the people struggling with the pressures of modern day society. I want it to inspire people. I want to have high profile guests on, um, people from any which way or walk of life. I want to hear their stories. I want to ask them questions. I want you to hear their thoughts on mental health and, and their recovery stories, you know, because 80, 90% of us, we're all struggling, you know. This, this life is tough. This life is hard. With something like the Flip the Mindset podcast, I believe I can bring a lot of hope to people's lives.